So uh, take this opportunity to reflect uh, on the Dhamma. This word reflect is, uh, you know, it has a very important way of looking, of, of opening to the present moment. You know, it's like reflection in the here and now is like this because uh, we're mentally conditioned to conceive things and then operate from positions, operate from desires and, and uh, attitudes and opinions that we acquire without reflecting on it. So we, you know, we find ourselves more or less becoming uh, addicted to various ways of looking and experiencing life. Just because we're conditioned to do so. And in the, in the Buddhist uh, teaching of the Four Noble Truths, it, it's a reflection on the way things are. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not idealistic about saying how things should be. The Buddha isn't telling us how life should be and how everyone should be, but uh, Encourage us to reflect on the way it is, and then that's that's the dhamma, the the reality of this moment. <clears throat> so the Buddha really is just saying, awaken to reality. It's as simple as that. When you want when people in England want to find out a de- definition of what Buddhism is about, I say, that, well, it's an invitation to awaken to reality. <laughs> Because uh, Dhamma, uh, you know, we have to use the word because we don't have a really proper equivalent in English, but reality is probably the, the one that I favor as a translation. And then awaken. <clears throat> so the Buddha is, means awakened consciousness of a human individual. And so this is why, like each one of us is a human being, and we may we think we're awake because our eyes are open, but we may be lost in our own world of views, opinions, attitudes, identities, habits, fears, and desires. <clears throat> and so that that's going to vary from one person to the next. But reality is always here and now. So you, it, how do you awaken to the here and now? And of course, uh, we're also have this gift of thinking and language, but it also, in many ways, is a curse because it, it, uh, we become very attached to thinking and identified with uh, the perceptions and conceptions that we have without reflecting or understanding what we're doing. We're merely caught in the, in the habitual clinging attachment identity with Conditions, the body, one's own body, or feelings, uh, memories, emotions, and of course, in the modern life, the emphasis is on individualism. Uh, you know, proving yourself, being somebody, uh, getting somewhere, achieving, attaining, and uh, then trying to get rid of bad habits and bad thoughts. And so it's all about thinking. Now, the, the biggest obstacle to seeing the path is uh, Sakya Ditti. It's uh, the first fetter. There's ten fetters, and the first one is uh, called Sakya Ditti, which is an ego or self-view, identity with through thinking. To become somebody, you have to think. You have to think, I am... Ajahn Sameo, then I become Ajahn Sameo. But if I stop thinking and just reflect on my mind without thought, there's no Ajahn Sameo. <laughs> but when, when I start thinking, I'm Ajahn Sameo, then I become that person. <clears throat> now, this is a way of experimenting with your mind, too, because, uh, you know, for years I wasn't Ajahn Sameo. I was somebody else <laughs> but this uh, 
this uh, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this, these three refuges are, um, you know, the kind of skillful means the Buddha gave us to, um, to change out of the personal interpretations of life, personal identities and views, opinions about oneself or others or the world in, in general. So we take refuge not in, in, in somebody's opinion about Dhamma or view about Buddhism or one's own view or preference in regards to Buddhism, but taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha means uh, in mindfulness. Like Buddha is, is really means awakened consciousness. Awakened and it's not a person anymore. It's not like a personality. It's not, we can never become a Buddha as a person. Uh, so <clears throat> when somebody claims that they're Buddha, you, you know, there's a sure sign that they're not. But uh, this word itself, we, when we take refuge in it, Bhutang Sarnangachami means that we take refuge in mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness, sati, and uh, sapanchanya, these work together because this allows us to uh, reflect on this moment. <clears throat> now, otherwise, we're merely operating from positions, attitudes, habits, and uh, the only chance for enlightenment is always here and now. Uh, awake and awake to the real. And so Puto is a, in this Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Man them, and these, these uh, kind of forest Ajahns, and Ajahn Cha, they, this is where I became acquainted with this, a kind of mantra, Puto. And uh, it, because I was, you know, I did, I had practiced a year of meditation on my own as a Samanera before I met Ajahn Chah. And I got to a certain point where I, I still had this grave doubt about what is it that sees Sakyaditi? What is it that can, can see the self? Is that a self, you know? So you get caught in trying to figure out, uh, that point beyond the Sakyaditi level that can recognize the ego. And then, of course, the Puto mantra suddenly, uh, uh, they translate it into Thai as Puru, or it's the, it's the knowing. Ru is a Thai word for knowing. Consciousness, then, is, is our ability to know in the present. And consciousness, then, is not personal. It's not my consciousness and your consciousness, but consciousness is a universal, has no boundary. And in the Western world, like, we were always con viewing consciousness as your head, you know, inside your brain. And, uh, and then in Buddhist meditation, you begin to recognize consciousness is, is, is not in your head. Your head is in consciousness. The whole body is in consciousness. And this is all consciousness. And each one of us is experiencing it from this position we find ourselves sitting in at this moment. But the consciousness is not personal. So it's not like my consciousness is different from yours. But it's, a, it's the knowing. And it's a, it's a profound knowing. It's not knowing about all kinds of things. It's not a cumulative knowledge from books and, and studies, but the direct natural knowing uh, of this moment. And so that's why this word reflection is, is beginning to awaken to this, noticing it's like this. So with basic meditation, you, you know, usually start out with something quite obvious like anapanasati or breathing. <clears throat> because that's happening right now. And it's, uh, it's not a particularly strong identity. Our egos don't really uh, strongly identify with the way our bodies breathe. And, uh, but it, it's, it's a necessity 
in order to survive is to breathe. So breathing is here and now, and then instead of conceiving breath as mind, you're, you're aware of inhalation is like this, exhalation is like this. So at this moment, you know, if you want, if you want to uh, reflect on the here and now reality of this moment, at least you can observe your inhalation and then exhalation is, and you're not judging it, you're not saying inhalation is better than exhalation. <laughs> Or my inhalations are better than Ajahn Kavali's. <laughs> I don't know if he is or better than mine, but it's like this. <laughs> and so this is, and this is an important kind of thing to get into your mind to trust yourselves to observe. You're not judging or criticizing. You're just observing, reflecting on inhalations like this, exhalations like this. Well, that sounds pretty boring, actually. If you, you know, if you've got an interesting mind that wants to figure out, you know, the ultimate reality, but uh, or which, who's an arahant and who isn't. But, but in terms of this moment, it's bringing the point of this is to center yourself in the present, because whether somebody's an arahant or not is, it, it's not up to you to to have. To figure that out, uh, you might be curious or doubtful or whatever, but and you can be aware of that. You know, is so and so an arahant, and then you, and then you can be aware that that's a, a question or a doubt. So then, the, the other thing at this moment, sitting here, we're all sitting, so that we all, they emphasize the four area boat, the four postures. Because we're always either throughout the day and night sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. So uh, they use these, just ordinary postures uh, that one uses throughout one's life. And so it, it's uh, sitting is like this. So this is, this is what I'm doing, reflecting on just this body sitting here is like this. And I can feel, just begin to notice the 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 reality of this body's weight on the seat and the feelings that come through just observing uh, this body as it sits at this moment is like this. You see, and, and saying like this or the way it is is merely a helpful way of looking rather than judging. You know, like uh, am I sitting well or properly or should I sit some other way? I didn't get caught in in views about sitting and full lotus posture or whether you need to sit or you don't need to sit then get caught up in all kinds of views and opinions because the Buddhist world is full of views and opinions. Everybody has their own technique and their own view about how to practice. But what you can know is right now the sitting is like this, breathing. And, and this is what I'm pointing to is the present, the Pachubana Dhamma, the here, the here and now reality is like this. Then you can be aware of also your state of mind, what kind of mood or emotional uh, quality are you having at this moment is like this. So the one thing I found when I went to stay with Lung Po Cha, was I didn't I didn't know Thai or Ethan languages, uh, and so there was a very a lot of uh, frustration, you know, of, of having to live in a totally different way, uh, with learning another language, and uh, different culture, different everything from what I was used to, and Ajahn Cha was was uh, encouraging me to observe the state of mind I was in. <clears throat> now I found that really helpful because, you know, because the, of the frustration and the feeling of, uh, you know, not knowing what's happening half the time, of 
being the only uh, foreigner in the monastery <laughs> and, and being the tallest monk in Ubon Rajatani at that time, <laughs> and so forth. So there was a, had to deal with a lot of self-consciousness and just habitual, uh, you know, irritation, frustration of not understanding, not fully comprehending, not knowing the cultural attitudes, but just trying to do the best I could uh, and try to fit in. And, but this also, this uh, observing the state of mind, jittanupasana is called the insight into the jitta or the condition of your mind and the present is like this. So that's reflecting on, I've got to reflect on this feeling of frustration, meaning what am I supposed to be doing now? And then uh, being able to observe this sense of being frustrated is like this, uh, feeling uh, alien or foreign or confused is like this, a lot of those kind of feelings, or misunderstanding, and sometimes I take things all the wrong way and get angry, or and then the attitude of reflecting on anger or whatever the state of mind that one is experiencing in the present is, is like this. And then this, this uh, teaching of all sankharas are impermanent. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's makes, makes our practice very, very easy because if all sankharas are impermanent, then that's all we have to know is observing the impermanence of sankharas that we're constantly experiencing, such as our posture, our breathing, our emotional state, our feelings, our thoughts, they're always in a, in a flux, in a change. And so we're, we're observing sankhara, we're observing anicca or impermanence. Uh, and we don't have to sort out all the different sankharas about which is, the, which is right, which is wrong. In terms of our lifestyle, we, we live in, in the Vinaya code. So we've already kind of determined the boundaries, you know, how to act and how to, what to do, what to, what's appropriate to say, what we shouldn't say, and so forth. So in terms of mindfulness, then we've we already have a, a kind of moral container, a boundary for behavior, and then we can observe the, be mindful of the different emotions that arise regarding our life within a form, within a structure, within a tradition, uh, within a, a culture that you find yourself in. So this is, you know, like, a, that's why, why the Buddha Dhamma is a, a kind of timeless teaching. It's not about becoming a Thai monk or trying to fit into Indian culture or whatever, but it's about using Dhamma and Vinaya for awakening to reality. Now most of us have, you know, have are highly conditioned with the sense of self. And then then the second Sangyojana is, uh, second better is Siddhapata Bharamasa, which uh, it's best to interpret that as like conventions, like uh, cultural conditioning, social conditioning, uh, things that we acquire that are not necessarily ego. You're not like one's ego is formed around that, but, but attitudes and assumptions one gets from being born in a particular society, a particular culture. <clears throat> so this is important because in Thailand, where you say someone like myself is American, then then coming to live in in a totally different kind of society, different culture, uh, you know, you it really reflects your own American conditioning. Uh, what that is in regards to uh, living in a society that isn't American, you know, where the attitudes and uh, social 
conditioning is very different. And so you become aware of, of the, uh, you know, the, the kind of conditioning you acquire when you're very young, when you're just an infant and, and that, or you're quite innocent, you just take on the, the attitudes and assumptions and prejudices and biases and so forth of your parents, of your social group, social identities, national identity, religious identities. And so then clinging to those things is sila patabaramasa. This is an obstruction to, because it's conditioned and we tend to, to operate from attitudes like our own cultural attitudes. So it's, you know, it's very, Americans are very good at comparing everything else with American values. Because, you know, those brought up to think American values are the best. And so, you, and not that I personally ever felt that, but that was a kind of assumption underlying the, the, the cultural conditioning there. So, and then through this awareness, one became aware of it, aware of this feeling, the kind of conceit of my own cultural conditioning. Uh, and sometimes the arrogance that, that, that I'd have in regard to it that would, uh, uh, you know, manifest in my mind. And then the third fetter is uh, wichikicha, which is translated as doubt. <clears throat> and doubt's always a result of attachment to thought. So, so if you, you know, whenever you think you're going to be get caught in your thoughts, then you'll end up with doubt as a result. So, like Mungpo Cha said, the one who thinks a lot, doubts a lot, which is very true. <clears throat> so thinking, then, is something we acquire also after we're born. We acquire the language of our parents. And, uh, and so we, we, are, we are conditioned to think in, in that particular way. Uh, and that then is, then we are attached to thinking. We're usually educated and then acquire the values of our particular generation or social group, religious group. And so these are, these three fetters are human created fetters. They're not natural conditions, uh, say that you're born with. You acquire a personality uh, cultural, social identity, and language after you're born. And so this is important because the, these three fetters are the obstructions to the path, to the seeing of the, the Eightfold Path clearly. So like for stream entry, you have to, you have to understand these three fetters uh, and, uh, and see the suffering, the the dukkha that arise from being attached to, to the ego, to social, cultural attitudes, biases, and prejudices, and to your own language habits. So that this is this is I just found this quite helpful because you know because these are created by human beings out of ignorance. You know we our parents weren't. My parents, at least, I don't know about yours, were not enlightened. They're very nice people. <laughs> but uh, they had their old biases and prejudices, as, as we all have. So <clears throat> I acquired that, those, you know, attitudes, assumptions, values uh, from after I was born, a sense of myself as being a you know, like being a, a man, a male. And uh, you say, you're a boy and your sister's a girl. First, I didn't, it didn't really matter, you know, when you're innocent. And then you acquire this sense of discrimination, girls, boys. <laughs> and uh, so this is, and then, then you're told boys are supposed to be like this, girls like that. So you're, you're getting all the messages and the uh, conditions conditioning of your particular cultural uh, system. 
Now the the Buddha was always pointing at what is natural, what is like in in uh, Thai language, nature is tama, dhamma, tamacha. They say so. This word dhamma is what it, it, you know is is a word that fits into the Buddhist language very well. We have the word nature, and nature, you know, in my cultural conditioning was something like you go out and look at nature. You say, I'm fed up with this city life. I'm going out to commune with nature. So you go out to the mountains or seaside or whatever. But <clears throat> I never really conceived of this as being natural. You know, m- myself and the body and and the mind and all that. It was like nature's out there, protect nature, laws of nature. Uh, but it's always separate from you. And then it's through the meditation here in Thailand that I began to recognize, well, this is all nature, you know, this this physical body's natural condition. I didn't create it as a, on a personal level, you know, identify with it, but it, it was born in, according to a natural process. And then uh, consciousness is natural. It's not... It's not personal. It's not created by human beings. And then uh, we're in a sense realm. We are in this realm where we're constantly being impinged on through the senses. So we're feeling all the time, feeling, you know, hot or cold, uh, pleasure, pain. We're experiencing through sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, all kinds of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings. That's natural. Because this is a sense realm. We've got sensitive bodies, senses. And so your life as a human being is the experience of total sensitivity from birth to death. It's a bit frightening when you think of it like that. <laughs> you realize that uh, what most people, what we all have to endure and why people are so, uh, you know, unhappy or experience suffering because we're constantly being impinged on and not just on the pleasant side but so much of our life is unpleasant painful or um, you know we're always getting hungry or thirsty or pain fatigue throughout the day (laughs) too hot or too cold and there's always this feeling of of, uh, of sensory experience. Now, the awareness of all this, this puto practice, sati sampachanya and then panya or wisdom, is the emphasis of the Buddha. <clears throat> so this emphasis is is awakening to this. It's not judging. It's not it, it, Buddha. You know, didn't advise us to commit suicide. Uh, in fact, we're not supposed to do that. It's an offense. <laughs> that once you do it, you can't confess it. <laughs> it's kind of final finality to it. But but the uh, but the, it's how to use this lifespan for awakened experience, the, the, the reality of awakened consciousness within the. This, the limitations of the form that we're in. So everybody, you know, you uh, is born, and then you get old and get sick and die. So these are the these are experiences that everyone we all share. You know, we all have birth. We already experienced that. We're already born, and now all you have to do is get old. And get sick and then die, and these are. This sounds rather depressing to positive thinkers, but this is this is a reflection. It's not a judgment about that this uh, this, this is bad or wrong. It's just noticing the way it is. Because when you're born, you know you don't grow younger. You always grow older, and uh, and then as and then you know as a baby, uh, you experience all kinds of physical discomfort, pain, and, and uh, hunger, and sickness. 
and that in, and these reoccur throughout your life and then and then uh, at my age the old age is definitely on the agenda you know <laughs> There's no way I can fool myself anymore that <laughs> and then death is the next event you know the important event the end of this this incarnation so there's uh it's a way of reflecting on the reality of life, which is not being negative or depressed, but opening to the way things are. So we're not deluding or creating illusions around uh, the world that we live in or the society uh, that we have to experience. Now, this is, to me, is like a kind of marvelous opportunity because... It, you know, it, not many people understand this. And so, you know, they live their lives not fully understanding themselves or the world. They don't awaken to reality. They more or less form attachments. And uh, from already a conditioned view of themselves, which they form maybe when they're very young. Like how many of you have a view of yourself that you formed when you were a child that still exists, how you interpret yourself in the, as you're older. You know, I can see in my, you know, in my age, 78, still the self-view was formed at an early age. And it still can operate in this, because of the power of early conditioning, a sense of your self-worth or lack of worth or social identity or whatever can pursue you throughout your life but in this kind of meditation you're, you're, you're no longer trying to get rid of it or judge it but observe it because it is a sankara that arises and ceases it's not like a permanent state when the conditions for self view arise then it comes and when the conditions are gone it ceases and so this is, mindfulness is our ability to observe the arising and ceasing, uh, both externally and internally. Now the important one is the internal observing. And this is, you know, to uh, be aware of just your own, <clears throat> you know, the, the body is like this. So you're changing your attitude from identity with your body uh, to observing it, you know, not, not criticizing it, not judging it, but just recognizing, and, you know, it's like this. You become, through these 32 parts of the body, meditation and so forth, with Kesa Loma Nakadanta Taja, when you ordain, you know, the ways of observing the kind of natural conditions of a human body that are not caught in a kind of sakyaditi level at all. They're not about, uh, you know, judgment or uh, how it should be, but it's like this. So even if you have ailments or you're disabled or whatever, there's still no obstruction to this kind of practice because it's not about why, why uh, somebody blind, they say, why do I have to be blind? Uh, can only create a sense of suffering because it's not fair according to how things should be. We should all be able to see perfectly according to my ideal <laughs> for, you know, like see perfectly throughout a whole lifetime of a hundred years is how it should be. But it's not like that. <laughs> so now i got this so, uh, macular degeneration and can't see very well and and so forth so and it's not fair no it's like this the vision at this moment's like this you know and so it's, it's observing it's using the way it is not not comparing it with some ideal of, of how I think it should be now this is the way out of suffering because the suffering is is thinking, you know, I don't want macular degeneration. I want to have good vision. Uh, I don't want to be blind. I want to die. when I die, I want to be able to see 20/20 vision. 
is uh, kind of foolish, you know, now, but uh, you get the point, is that how things should be is one way, but how things are is not how they should be, but this ability to recognize all conditions are impermanent. So you get back to this simple, simple reality of impermanence, so just the, the thought, I have macular degeneration, is a thought, you know. If I cling to that thought, then I can make myself suffer because, you know, personally, I don't want macular degeneration. <laughs> and it goes on into a realm of dukkha. But, but if it's, if it's a sati sampatanya, then if this is, seen is like this, then, and, uh, it's not saying that anything about it is just recognizing the bodies like this, aging 78-year-old bodies like this. And then here in uh, uh, in monastic life, here at Nanacha, you know, you, you can use this kind of practice. It's the way it is. What Nanacha is like this. It's not, you know, you might have views of how it should be, but the, the important thing is to recognize that this perception of what Nanachat is like this, you know, whatever perception or feeling you have about it, the practice would be to recognize your feeling is like this, your perception is like this. Now, doing this kind of practice, I've been doing it, this is my 40 six pantsa and then I spent the years of some there so 47 years of, of this kind of investigation but it you know you, you do get insight at least I had insight quite rapidly but uh, over these 46 47 years you know it's to really put it to the test to really use it in terms of the experiences that that each one of us must have with life. And so in uh, 1977, I went to live in uh, England and was there for 34 years. But this kind of practice was already, uh, you know, I already had, a, a, you know, confidence in this way of practicing. So it didn't really make much difference where I was at. You know, it wasn't, you know, whether you're in England or Thailand or whatever, it, the thing is to be aware of the state of mind, the uh, the kind of emotional reactions you have to the experiences that you encounter. And it works because you can, it, it's not something, asking you to do something beyond your ability. It's just learning to trust yourself to do it. You know, because how many of you really have much self-confidence or trust yourself? Uh, you know, we tend to uh, be very self-critical. So we, we, uh, you know, like in, uh, I found teaching in, in the West, <clears throat> mainly in England, people are, you know, culturally programmed to criticize themselves. So it's it's very much you know pay attention to all the flaws, the weaknesses, the mistakes you've made in life, <laughs> and and, uh, and that's that's being real you know that's and so you, people tend to see themselves only through uh, their mistakes or their faults or weaknesses. And that very much my background too. I'm from a, that kind of culture where you you're always emphasizing something what's what you did wrong or the weakness or the mistakes you've made in life. And so Lumpa Cha, when I when I came to live with him, he he could see that. And so he said, you know, you you contemplate your goodness, your virtues. And that's the first time, you know, I was 33 years old. 
and I never contemplated my virtues. And so I, I didn't even know that I had any. <laughs> because I was so busy, uh, you know, aware of everything that was wrong with me. So uh, it was a new take. And then there was a kind of fear, like uh, I'm going to become, uh, my ego is going to inflate. And I'm going to become arrogant and proud. If I think I start thinking I have virtues, then... You don't know where that's going to take me. It's better, safer to think, well, you know, I've got, you know, this, I've made these mistakes. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> and to, and to, at least my generation of Americans, this was being honest about yourself. You know, let's be honest. And so you, they tell me this truth about yourself and then you recite, you know, you kind of confess all the things you shouldn't have done and so forth. But also, you know, why are any of us here at Nanachat at this time? Because of, of our faults or because of our virtues? Well, to me, you know, you, you enter a Buddhist monastery because of uh, virtue. I didn't come to a Buddhist monastery to become a criminal or, <laughs> or <laughs> You know, to tell lies or steal or do wicked things, you can. You know, that's the last place you want to do. You want to come to if if that's the, your inclination. So, and I think, well, I must be rather, you know, good person to to really come and live under you know this strict vinaya, which you know was. At first, really seemed very daunting to have to live in such a controlled way after living, you know, my youth in California, where you, you could do what you wanted. So, uh, but also there was a recognition of the goodness of living with good monks like Lung Po Cha and the monks uh, that I trained with at Wat Bar Pong. And then the generosity, like people come, like today, this morning, all the people coming to offer requisites to the Sangha. Is, you, you, you know, for the monastic life, I've lived in the realm of, of goodness, where, you know, whether it's in Thailand or in England, it tends to attract that, those qualities from people. Like people that come here, usually come here to offer something to, you know, there's, you're letting them express their virtue in some useful way. So then, you, you know, and Lung Po Cha always recognized the, the goodness in human beings. Where my cultural background was, I was more aware of the flaws in others too. I was a critical person. So I could recognize the faults in others more easily than their virtues. And that's conditioned, isn't it? That's con- we're conditioned to do that. We're from a, a society that emphasizes criticism. You know, how things should be, you know, is very high. How things are is the way they shouldn't be, usually. Or if they are, you know, all right, we can always think of ways of making them better uh, and trying to improve everything uh, to make it more close, more to fit the absolute ideal. But notice the difference with, in the Buddhist attitude is the way it is, not the way it should be. And apply that to yourself, you know, not how you should be, but the way you are, you know. So it's not approving or judging, but recognizing, uh, you know, your, your own mental states uh, and not in terms of Judgment, but recognizing them in terms of sankaras, arising, ceasing. So then this puto recognizes sankara. So it's coming from this, this pure, pure consciousness. It's not, it's not a sankara. It's, it, it is the recognition of sankara. So can one sankara recognize another or if we let go of sankaras, then this, then this puto, this knowing, uh, insight knowledge or wisdom operates through these forms. 
and then we can know things as they really are. And then it's summed up in these sape sankarani cha sape tamanata. Like all conditions are impermanent. All dhamma is not self. There's no permanent self in anything, in any condition. There's no soul as the kind of personal soul that I have or uh, anything that I can find that is just mine. All I can recognize is consciousness and and then that's puto, knowing dhammo, knowing the way it is, the, the awakened to reality. So if you, just to encourage you to to use this, uh, this this is a very profound teaching. It's a basic patomatesana, uh, tamajaka, pawatana suit. And uh, I, when I ordained, I I determined when I was a samanera that I would mainly use this Four Noble Truths teaching just to see just to prove whether it was worked or didn't. <laughs> and because somehow, when I was a summoner, I had this book called Word of the Buddha, and it printed in Sri Lanka, and it was just the basic teachings taken out of the suttas about the Four Noble Truths. So I've used that for 47 years. <clears throat> and then always reflecting from that, you know, the suffering, its causes, this, the cessation of suffering and the way of non-suffering. And so, but this has to be, you have to look here to do it. You know, you, you can become a poly scholar and, and uh, know all about from the scriptures and that, but you still haven't seen it till you actually apply it to to your mind, to your own jitta. And so recognize that that which is aware, aware of conditioned phenomena. So then your your refuge is in awareness. And then conditioned phenomena is not judged or or, you know, loved or hated, but it's recognized. It's like this. All conditions are impermanent. And then in regards to living one's life as a human, then the, this form is a very good one, a Buddhist monastic form, because it, you know, it works in England, you know, a country that isn't Buddhist. It wasn't really difficult being a monk there. You know, it was it's a very tolerant country towards religion. So, so you're never persecuted or, or treated badly. And, and in terms of interest and uh, four requisites are abundant, you know, over the top. I got very fat living in England. Food was very rich. <laughs> and so I didn't lack for food, shelter, robes, and medicine. And then uh, also the goodness of the people. It, the, this form tends to bring that quality out in others because uh, monasteries in England were like centers where people could come and uh, and and they appreciated that you know they they're quite grateful to have a, a, in a busy life in a city like London and the confused realm of modern Europe you know where nobody knows what they're doing anyway it was a kind of relief to come to a to a monastery just to have a little peace and quiet and then they'd take you know become interested maybe in meditation so uh, you know i i look back at the, this is a very i feel very blessed by this life because it it re- you know, it's something I'm very grateful for that I really wasn't expecting. 
you know, it wasn't part of a, my cultural expectation to become a Buddhist monk. <laughs> but it's what happened. And so just to encourage you to, you know, that this is something to, that's practical too. It's something to use, not just, it's not just, you know, kind of magical formula or, or just a, 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 a custom to, to go along with. But how to use it, how to make it work for you, that's up to you. All we can do is kind of provide the facilities and the conditions and then the rest is, they say, the ball's in your court. So I'll stop. <laughs>